Sea of Red, it's time for another Fireside Chat, the official podcast of Flames fans. It's go time. Happy Thanksgiving, everybody, and I'm Dan alongside Matt. We're back for season 11. Matt, we've been doing this for longer than I think people even knew podcasts were around. I know. We actually started in the last lockout. We were getting ready to go, and then they're like, no, no hockey anymore for a while. You know, if, if we were NHL players, 11 years would be classified a good career, but here we are still alive and kicking, and they're not ready to put us on waivers yet. Yep. Although Our no trade clauses have probably expired, so we might end up on Oilers podcast at some point, but we're yeah. still here for now. Oh, no. We're a member of the Coyotes podcast in community. That's right. <laughs> well, let's... Uh, Let's jump into the 2022-2023 season with talking about what's happened uh, before even training camp and some contracts that got signed, shall we? Yep. That sounds like a lot of fun and a lot of things to talk about. <laughs> well, these three probably aren't as much fun as you're hoping for, but uh, just so we can sort of you know get the story straight, the Calgary Flames re-signed Adam Rzizka to a two-year deal. It's 762500 That's an odd number. No wonder it took them... So long to get that deal done. They were trying to figure out exactly where to round that number, I bet. Well, you, you can run into situations like Edmonton where they have like $135 in cap space. So, you know, you got to pinch any, every penny. And then they brought back Brett Ritchie on a one-year deal at 750000 And on October 3rd, claimed Radom Zahorna from uh, the Pittsburgh Penguins. He's making a league minimum, actually cleared waivers today, and is now on his way to the Stockton Heat, at least start the year. And the Calgary two contracts, Wranglers. Oh, sorry, that's right. It's going to take me a little while to remember that. I'm still calling them the... I, I've been... Before the Wranglers name came out, I was informally calling them the Calgary Stocktons. Yeah, I know. I, I've been mentioned... Like, every time I've been talking about sending players to the farm in conversation, it's like, oh, they're sending them to Stock... Uh, I mean... Calgary, yes. <laughs> That's right. Stock- Off to Winsport you go. <laughs> you know, the, this city keeps uh, annexing new land. Next thing you know, we're going to have a neighborhood in Calgary named Stockton, and that's where they'll have to live. Yeah. <laughs> um, but you're right. So he's off to the Calgary Wranglers. Uh, and the next two contracts probably worth a little bit of discussion. Mackenzie Weger finally re-signed here. It's a $50 million deal over eight years, which means an average of $6.25 million per year. He has a full no trade for the first four years and a 10 team no trade after that. Matt, when this deal happened, I had said to you, I thought both guys would be signed by Christmas or you'd see them moved out of here. I think the Flames needed to make a statement that players want to play here, players want to stay here, players want to be a Flame after what happened. And we've got pretty much both guys that we acquired in that deal locked up. What a great deal, I think, for Weger. At 6.25, he shares the same salary as Jeff Petrie. Josh Morrissey and Matthias Eckholm, and I'd say he's a better defenseman than all three of those guys. Oh, for sure. And it makes that uh, deal that the Oilers signed Darnell Nurse to look abysmal at like nine and a quarter for, frankly, an inferior defenseman to Mackenzie Weger. So it'll be interesting to see how things pull out. And, you know, one of the critiques of Weger um, when he was with the Florida Panthers was the glaring mistakes. And he would do lots of, he would be trying too hard and he'd turn over the puck. And usually it'd be a, like a breakaway or like a really high dangerous scoring chance for the other team. And that's why he has a lot of misconceptions about like just how good of a defenseman he is. Because when he does screw up, it tends to be in spectacular fashion. The thing is, is that uh, two other defensemen that the Flames had, uh, Nikita Zadorov, who re-signed, and Erika Branson, were also known for that heading into their contracts with the Flames last season. And Daryl Sutter was able to work with the pair of them to get that out of their game. So it'll be interesting to see if uh, Daryl is able to work his magic with Uyghur as well to remove Who's Uyghur's that. partner in Florida? Um, mostly Ekblad, but it changed uh, because Ekblad was in and out of the lineup so often that it it was basically all of them <laughs> at some points. It's just because, you know, you have to make do with what you have when your number one's out for, you know, good portions of the year. 
Yeah, and I mean, you know, Uyghur's an older defenseman for sure, but I think that, you know, still still young enough he can change his game and work with Daryl. And, you know, I, I'm i not going to comment on the length on these. I think a lot of these deals, as we talked about in the summer, are a little bit longer than they should be for guys this age. But if the Flames can win this cup in, you know, three, four years here during their window, I don't think anybody's going to care. No, and the thing is, is that uh, the one player that uh, Uyghur has reminded me of pretty much like throughout his career development has been Mark Giordano, um, where both of them were like Giordano was not uh, drafted and was an unsigned free agent. Uyghur was a late round draft pick. Both struggled in the minors for a while. And then when they finally made the NHL, it was a slow burn until they took off and like Uyghur, he took off last season fully and was one of the very best defensemen in the NHL. And it'll be interesting to see over the, the duration of his contract, if he continues to mature in much the same way that Giordano did, because that will like, if he does and actually improves his game a little bit more, like if he can remove the glaring mistakes that he makes on occasion, like that six and a quarter is going to look very much like Elias Lindholm's contract where it's like this guy's getting like, we're getting like a half price basically. Or, you know what I mean? Like he could well, be and, like and a $9 million six, value. Yeah. And six to five. I mean, you know, our next highest uh, defenseman is I think four and a half with Anderson. So it really also sets or no, sorry, four, four, nine with uh, Hannafin. Yeah. And then four, four, four five with Anderson. So, I mean, even then, if you're Noah Hannafin and your agents come and saying, well, I want a, an extension, you got that weaker contract. And I think that, you know, tree living so good at this say, well, okay, are you better than McKenzie? And I think that's really where it's going to set that, that number for our defense. So I like that as sort of a benchmark. It's like, remember when they signed geo and they said, no one to make more than geo. Yeah. And to be fair, like if Hannafin progresses as much, you know, like takes another step, like he took a big step last year, um, to emerge as a solid two way defenseman. If he takes another step by the time he, uh, gets to the point where he's a free agent, uh, he might end be of this making, year. isn't it the end of next year? Uh, Oh, you're right. Yeah. 2023, 2024. I was looking at yeah. the wrong column. Um, that, uh, he might be an $8 million defenseman, but that might also be, you know, with inflation appropriate. So it, it but you know, the money that they save on Uyghur, uh, definitely helps to keep a guy like Hannafin for the long term if they can. And like, it makes sense or Anderson too, like, cause I know there are, he's up around the same time too so yeah he's uh anderson i'll go till the end of 2025 2026 so we still have four years in that deal yeah so anyhow um and like what a good defense core to have for like you have three guys making under five million with uh tanev anderson and hannafin Uyghur making six and a quarter like i would take that top four over literally any other team's top four I in still, the NHL. I still think Big Z is overpaid, but, um, you know, every team's got one. Well, for he brings a different dimension, that, and that's why he's getting a million more than he probably would if he was, like, six foot. And, you know, he's getting the I'm tall and I will smash you bonus. <laughs> so Yeah, but it al almost uh, four million. Oh, it's three and a half. That's not too bad. Three seven five uh, yeah. for two years. I don't know, but it's not well, the that, worst thing. Well, that discussion later in the season. Yeah, the, it, it's still not the worst thing. Like uh, he was uh, last year, he was very much worth the four million dollars that he was getting. Um, so you know, it, it's one of those where because of the fact that he is such a big physical defenseman, like those guys always get overpaid. Like you look at what, uh, good Branson is making. He's, he got a four, four deal, uh, in Columbus and he's about the same caliber of player as, uh, Zadorov. And actually Zadorov was offered that contract by Columbus. So, you know, um, he actually took less to stay here and, It'll be interesting to see, and especially with that number six spot being either um, 
Connor Mackey or Michael Stone until uh, Shillington returns. Uh, you know that that also helps. It, well, let's let's that, work our way a, to that. Yeah, because that's just another cheap defenseman. Is what I was gonna finish off with. So Matt, the uh, the next contract here, the one that was announced yesterday, this must be something you're giving thanks for. Is a big booster of his. Daryl Sutter re-signs with the Calgary Flames on a two-year extension. So he's got this one and two more. And to me, it like when we first signed him to the three-year contract for the COVID season last year and this year, it made sense uh, in terms of like if this team was going to fall apart into a rebuild, then having him only on the three-year deal made sense because he would allow the team that was to shoot their shot and rebuild. But the with Treliving's frank wizardry this off season. When has he not been a wizard? But that's another discussion. Uh, I know. Like this, put it this way, he earned himself GM of the year like eight moves ago. <laughs> we we might as well just you know have etch his name on it now. Yeah, like there is literally nothing that I think any other GM could do to match just the insanity of this. Like the, this, frankly, was the craziest off season that any team has ever faced in NHL history. Like, literally no team has lost two 100-point players in the same offseason ever. And to actually kind of improve your team after all of that is nothing short of miraculous. So, you know, but um, because of the fact that um, Trill Living was able to pull off that kind of offseason, it, it makes perfect sense. The Flames are still in. We're going for the cup now mode. And having a multiple time Stanley cup champion behind the bench. Yeah. That's exactly what you need. I have a feeling that this is one of those things where Daryl's re upped, but if the flames win before then he's done, like I think he's in this for a cup. It gives him two more years. I think if he gets it, he'll retire again. Possibly. Um, it, I think it I'm depends. not saying he won't be with the organization. I just don't know if he would be the head coach behind the bench at that point. If he wins, like, say the Flames hypothetically win the Cup this season, I could see him wanting to do an L.A. situation where, okay, let's go have another one. <laughs> you know, um, just because you got the one out of the way, let's see if we can't, you know, make a dynasty of this. And, you know, because yeah. it, it, you got to imagine that Daryl's a very competitive guy, you know, because he's so soft-spoken and, and quiet and demure behind the bench. That you know, he I I would assume that you know he wouldn't be just content with one. <laughs> you know, and I've had the chance to sort of talk to Daryl last couple of years uh, as you know part of the media team with the Flames, and um, he's you can tell he's having more fun. Like we're getting, I've almost said the the version of Daryl Sutter we're getting right now is Bob Hartley one liners coming from Grumpy Daryl. Like we're getting some funny lines from Daryl, and you can tell that he's just he's enjoying it here. Yeah, and uh, not that's not to say that he wasn't funny before, but but know. he was always more kind of grumpy before, and even now you get the grumpy lines. Um, but it's you know it's it, yeah, it just seems like he's he's given us more one-liners. He's I think sometimes he's trying to crack jokes. If you watch the video of the press conferences, he'll sometimes say something, and then like look around like he's waiting for a laugh. Yeah, true enough. One of my favorites in the playoffs was uh, somebody asked him after that game at Edmonton where he put Vladar in. They said, so, Daryl, what did you say to, to Marky when Vladdy was going in? He said, I turned to Marky and said, Marky, Vladdy's going in. <laughs> yep. So, but yeah, I think, you know, again, he's the guy that got the Flames further than they have been in a while. He deserves to be here. I think management wants him here. We don't know what the money is, but I can't see him getting a huge raise. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I have no problem with Daryl coming back for two more years. No, and we're in win-now mode. So, it, And frankly, if you look around the NHL, uh, there are not too many coaches that even say are on par with what Daryl brings behind the bench. So, you know, and his leadership is one of the main reasons why this team has been able to endure the offseason that they did. Just like I think we've seen that, you know, Trey Living is the right GM for this team right now. I think we can all say Daryl Sutter is the right coach for this team right now. Oh, for sure. 
Um, and the last, no- I guess, note here on guys coming and going, the Calgary Flames have lost one of their former first-round draft picks. Yuso Valimaki was placed on waivers and picked up by the Arizona Coyotes. So I know there's been some question here, will he make the NHL? He's definitely going to be on an NHL roster now. Well, if you can call Arizona a hockey t- Oh, wait, you know. <laughs> um, anyhow, um, it with how poorly he his development has gone, which hasn't been his fault with injuries and COVID and and and. Um, frankly, you know, the extra $500,000 in cap space is actually a, a win. And, you know, literally an addition by subtraction because he was not going to make the NHL. And so, yay I kinda, money. I kind of thought that he might start the season here just because we're short Oliver Shillington. Um, and sort of had the chance to work his way into the lineup. Yeah, he just didn't earn it. Like, he was bad, uh, to be blunt. Like, And it, it's not on him, because he's still finding his way from all those injuries. And, like, we saw how Sean Monaghan got derailed in his career. It, you know, it, it's the same story. It's just that Valimaki got it right bef- as he was coming into his own as a player and you know the potential was always there and you know and whether he can year, reclaim himself even in last Arizona, year in the hl didn't he get suspended or something he was out for a couple games because he got suspended down there i think yeah and he was not very good in stockton which hey we actually can refer it to it as there you stockton. Go, in the past tense yes um and he wasn't very good in Stockton. He wasn't the top pairing defenseman there for most of the season. And, you know, Connor Mackey, who is more of a, like an adequate NHL prospect, um, has basically supplanted him in the lineup entirely. And it's one of those things that if you're not on your way up, you're on your way out. And, uh, Valimaki just like if, if he had cleared waivers, he would have stayed, and you know the Flames probably would have re-signed him this off season. But it's one of those where it it just it, it does not make any sense to keep him, and like he was not he was about the tenth best defenseman at camp, and when you only need at most. You know, like that just doesn't cut it. And, you and know, and the fact that he went on waivers and got, you know, claimed by a top team, you know, top waiver priority team, I think tells us there probably wasn't a lot in the trade market either. I've seen a lot of Flames fans say, saying, oh, the Flames should have tried to move him. I don't think at this point you get a lot for him. I've thought in the past the Flames could move him for something, but right now, especially like you said, with how bad he looked at training camp, I don't think there was any value to be had in a trade. No, and Arizona's basically like, well, hey, let's roll the dice on the kid, and it's not likely going to turn out, but hey, most of our prospects are not very good anyway, so it doesn't hurt. And, you know, like, Arizona's not a very good team at any level, uh, so it it makes sense for that. Like, he instantly becomes one of their top players in on their farm team if not starting in the NHL. Uh, I think I think he'll be on their NHL. He might be the number seven, but I think he's a guy who'll be on their NHL roster. Yeah. Um, and it's just one of those where, you know, hopefully he turns it around and develops because you don't want to see somebody's life get uh, screwed over basically by injuries and bad circumstances with when COVID hit. Um and all of that did interfere with Valimaki's recovery. And, you know, like if he does make it when he's like, say, 25, 26, then great for him, you know, mm-hmm. and, you know, and, uh, and, I don't and I'll think be that... cheering for him. Like, it's one of those where it's just unfortunate that it's not with us, but it literally is one of those where it's not going to work here and it's, you know, not good for him to be stuck here either so and i you know this sounds maybe bad to him but i don't think the flames lose a lot i mean like you no. said we've got mackey you know Malosha's look good i think even stone can fill that spot for now like it's not like we're losing a guy that we're going to be 
struggling to fill. I think, you know, he's, I don't want to call him a bust yet, but I don't think he's ever amounted to nearly what he was expected to be. And I think it's an easy guy to replace. Oh, yeah. And, like, literally the best part of that is clearing up $500,000. And it's literally an addition by subtraction, just like trading out Monaghan. It's not on the player. It's nothing negative against Valenaki. At this point, it's just, hey, the money that you're getting paid, we can use that better elsewhere. And you get an opportunity to actually resume your career in a better place for where you're at. So, it, And the last two guys I can think yeah. where that happened was uh, Brett Kulak and Paul Byron. And both guys went on to do well for themselves. So I'm hoping for the same yeah. here from Valimaki. Oh, yeah. And, you know, Calgary is always willing to do their players a solid, like, if the, it doesn't, you know, work out. And they will try to find ways of you know and if he had passed through waivers the flames easily would have kept them on stock uh, the wranglers um for a while until it he didn't take those next steps. maybe they would send him to stockton just send him there by himself yes <laughs> uh but um you know it's one of those where he will get more of an opportunity in arizona and it's one of those where if Calgary was not an elite team, he might have had a chance to work it out here. But it's one of those where he needs to be on a bad team to get his game back and, you know, an opportunity to play. And, and that's well said. I think looking from the player's perspective, I mean, nobody wants to play for a bad team. But looking from the player's perspective, I think this is a great opportunity for him to to work his way up on a non-crowded blue line depth chart. Yeah, because... Like, if he actually shows that he's competent and can play good hockey, even on a minimalist level, you're playing on a bad team, so you're naturally going to be more of a priority just because of your age than insert miscellaneous older guy that's a fill-in. And if Chikrin gets moved, as there's talk about, they'll have an opening there. So, yeah, then there's some opportunity for him in Arizona for sure. Yeah, and, you know... I wish nothing but the best for him on a personal level. It just, it sucks that it's not here, but for him, he is in a better place now for his own development and, you know, all the power to him. Moving on to Flames training camp, guys that are, I guess, also not here. Um, we saw two guys brought in that I thought had some promise for training camp, and that was Cody Eakin and Sonny Milano, both brought in on PTOs. Oliver Shillington did not attend camp. He's in Sweden dealing with a personal matter. We'll swing back around to that. But um, Eakin and Milano, were you surprised that both of them got cut? Um, oh, I wanted both of them here, like looking at the possible PTOs. I kind of expected and, one of them to be here. And so, like, the fact that they brought both of them in, I was actually quite delighted because they both seemed like players that might be found money um, with Milano's offensive abilities and Eakin being a solid two-way player. Um, it's just one of those where the Flames have a ton of good fourth liners between Rooney, Lewis... Rujitska, uh, Lucic, um, Richie, uh, now Zahorna. Um, so they only need four or five of those guys. They already have five or six. Uh, it, it's one I of think those the hope where... was that one of those guys would push for a top nine role. And yeah, I'll oh, be yeah, frank, Milano sure. looked terrible. Oh, yeah, he was awful. Um, like, like I, it, when, the, when the Flames brought him in, I was sitting there thinking, I wonder why this guy's still a free agent. And I saw him play, I'm like... That's why he's still a free agent. Yeah. It's like, uh, go to Europe and, you know, play first line minutes over in Sweden or the Swiss league or, or even wherever join and, our, join our new friends in rapid city with the rapid city rush for a year. Yeah. And, you know, go kick some butt and, you know, maybe figure out what you need internally to take that next level step because, you're not an NHL player. Like it literally looked like Josh Levo without the motivation, which that's not, you know, like Levo at least had enough drive during games 
that even though he was quite mediocre, you could see he was trying. Uh, Milano was basically the same kind of he's there without the actual drive. And it's like you're squandering your shot, man. And yeah, it, it was and not I very thought, good. And I thought Cody Eakin looked fine. But like you said, he really, I think he looked like a fourth liner. And we've got enough of those guys already. If we didn't, if we hadn't re-signed Richie and we didn't bring in Zahorna, I could definitely have seen uh, Eakin getting yeah. uh, even a number 13 spot here. Yeah. And like if the Flames didn't have Lewis or Rooney like yeah sure he would have been a perfectly viable fourth line center that that would have been you know just the decent face off guy and otherwise unremarkable and you know like it was only like a couple of years ago when he was with Vegas that he scored 40 points and you know with him going to buffalo it's like yeah he dipped but is that because buffalo is abysmal or you know, on Edmonton when they were rebuilding levels or, you know, is he taking a, a major step back? And like, I, I've always liked Eakin back when he was with Dallas and then with Vegas. And I think he overperformed but, in Vegas. I don't think Vegas was where you would get him again. I think that was an anomaly season. Oh, for sure. But it was like, he was very serviceable in Dallas as well. And you know, the hope was that, well, if he, it, it's just a product of being in Buffalo. Well, yeah, a lot of players suck on bad teams. And then once they're liberated are fine, but he didn't seem like there was anything more than Buffalo's version of Eakin, which is adequate. And like, he will probably sign somewhere in the NHL because everybody he's, needs like, he's destined for one specific team. The Arizona Coyotes, do you know what the name of their rink is this year? No. Mullet Arena. Perfect. There's nobody that should be playing in Mullet Arena more than Cody Eakin. Yeah, exactly. Like, he can be the team's mascot. He can be the statue that's in Mullet Arena. It's not what a great name for a hockey arena. Yeah, that's special. <laughs> Um, I, I don't know who Mullet is, Mr. or Miss Mullet, who it's named after, but yeah, Cody Eakin needs to go. If, if you're not sure what we're talking about, um, go Google Cody Eakin and you'll see what we're talking about. Yeah. Um, and the last guy who was on camp, in camp, who is still around, Michael Stone, and I was kind of surprised. I mean, he didn't sign with the Flames this year. Usually he's one of the first signings, and he's still, as of now, on a PTO. Do you think that Stone gets signed? Yeah. Oh, I guaranteed. I think that uh, the only reason he hasn't been is just for flexibility purposes, for whatever reason the team might have. But, uh, uh, you know, unless they say that he's not coming back, I'm assuming that he is because he scored three goals and looked good during all of the games. You know, like he did make a few mistakes, but. You know, like he'd also be a third pairing, seventh defenseman. Well, that's so. it. Look at, looking at our bottom pair right now with uh, Shillington out, I'd rather have him in the lineup than Nicholas Maloche. Yeah. And like if you're looking at uh, like what Stone can bring to the power play, like that's a dynamic that the Flames haven't really had since like Adrian O'Coin and uh, Dennis Weidman, you know, were able to just fire off those howitzers. And, you know, um, Stone has been rather effective in the offensive zone and you know if he can do that on a regular even though he might only get like 10 12 mo minutes a night like that's huge you know because anytime a player can actually chip in you know, playing that a um, few minutes that, like that's a very useful player i think that stone's playoff performance has earned him um a I, I guess, yeah, it's earned him a full-time contract if he wants it here, which I think he does. And I think, you know, even if he's your number seven, we've seen nothing in Stone's game that tells us he shouldn't be on this roster. We, he's not Sonny Milano. He's not Cody Eakin. He hasn't performed poorly. I'd say he's been one of the better defensemen out there. And we know there's also a guy that can go months without playing and still look good. And I could also see this year, if Stone is here, an AHL stint even if for no other reason than to maybe drum up some uh, some business for the AHL team. But I could see them drop him down to the Wranglers. Hey, I finally said it right. Uh, drop him down to the Wranglers for you know a week or two just to keep him going. Yeah. 
It'll, it'll be interesting to see one way or the other. But I'm fully expecting tomorrow at 3 p.m. Calgary time, the Flames have to announce their opening day roster and be cap compliant. I fully expect Stone to be on that roster. I expect a league minimum deal, but I expect him to be on that roster. Yeah, uh, well, and that's where, like, the flexibility, like, especially with the extra 500000 like, now they have nearly $2.5 million to play with. If you sign Stone, then that eats into that a bit. Um, so it, it, it's one of those where if the Flames are going to make a trade, because uh, that also is possible, um, it, we'll see. And just that extra bit of flexibility helps. For sure. And let's talk about, I guess, the most notable absence. We don't have a lot of information, but Oliver Shillington has not been at camp. Um, he stayed in Sweden. We've been told that there's a personal issue. We're not going to speculate on that issue, that issue out of respect for Oliver, but I'm kind of surprised that as a guy who got a new contract, uh, he's not here. And when we start hearing personal issue, it worries me. I mean, if you remember last year, we saw... Um, what was it? Jeff uh, Delorier out of Montreal had a personal issue that kept him out of the lineup. So I, I'm I'm worried about Shillington there. Like I'm hoping he's okay. I'm hoping he'll be back. But any guy who's missed training camp, you wonder what speed he's going to be at when he comes back and when he'll be back. Yeah, it'll be. It's one of those where because of the nature of uh, what the problem is, um, it, like there's just no real idea where to go on like what the problem is like calgary was being kind of cryptic other than saying like it's not a substance abuse problem but you know like it could be a family health problem it, yeah, you I know mean, mental it, health it could, problem it, like well, that's it, it yeah it could be mental health could be a lot of things yeah and like it's not you know it's nobody's business except his and the flames until it, the time that it's dealt with to figure out, well, okay, what is the actual issue and, 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 and like we saw with Columbus, uh, Texier, he got allowed to just go sign in France for a year, uh, because he's been having some issues and, you know, it might be a similar situation where Shillington has to play over in Sweden for a year because yeah the, the question there would be what happens i mean so he's making a lot more than taxi is do you do you, um ir him then do you is he technically non-reporting like it would be because the flames could really use that salary cap space if they can put him on the ltir that would free up almost two and a half million dollars of uh money for us to use but it's just kind of weird to have him floating around not knowing where he is not knowing when he'll be back yeah and i think that like with um like that that amount of money like if he isn't able to be back for this season or a good portion of it like the flames will probably ltir it or if it's uh, ltir eligible i mean if yeah. it's not an injury you can't if his mom's sick he can't ltir him yeah well i think that you can get exemptions for like non-roster players or something you'd have to talk to the league i wonder if they at that point it would be and I, this sounds bad and i don't mean this sound bad but i wonder if it'd be at some point failure to report like okay he hasn't reported to our team therefore we're spending him for a year to get the salary cap even though you know we're not quote unquote spending them that might be the legal term you have to put on the form for the league yeah or tolling his contract or, you know, like yeah. insert miscellaneous. And it's one of those where until we get more information from the team or Shillington himself, it's a wait and see and, you know, like react to whatever the move will be when the move will be made. And, you know, if Calgary has to, you know, sit his contract out and is able to basically write off that, you know, like another two and a half million dollars is a big deal. Because, like, if, you know, like, say the Flames have to play Michael Stone just for sake of argument as the sixth defenseman while Shillington's gone, like, the Flames will have basically five million dollars in cap space which you know when it comes time to the deadline like that makes a huge difference and you know like the flames could go and get a big fish if we need to so you know it it's one of those where we'll have to wait and see um 
Yeah, I don't it, even it, know. I w- you don't want to go get a big fish though, unless you know he's out. Because as soon as he's back, you got to be cap compliant. Oh so. yeah, and uh, I'm sure that you would know and 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 beforehand. Um, and it's also one of those things that, like, in terms of the defensive group, getting Mackenzie Weger um, helps in this uh, specific manner a big deal because. Uh, Shillington was one of the very few defensemen who was very good on the breakout, and that is one of Mackenzie Weger's strengths as a defenseman. So having him having the ability to rush up the ice, uh, at least for the time being, won't be missed to the same degree that it would be if Weger wasn't here. But it'll well, I be think nice. just having a, a serviceable defenseman is going to help too. I mean, if we had no Weger and no Shillington... I mean that really leaves you with a big hole on your on your back end. You'd have Tanev, Hannafin, Anderson. We didn't even know if Tanev would be back, Zadorov, yeah. and you're missing really two guys there. Yeah. Then you'd have Stone and Mackey as your third pairing, which you're kind of getting into well, you're needing a defenseman t- territory. Exactly. And you know, like that'll do, I suppose, but hey, that's not very good. And instead, it's you know, it's adequate with uh, Shillington being gone, but you know, it'll be a big deal when he comes back, too. Yeah, you know, and I mean, even if the Flames ha- aren't going to have him, I could see them go out. I mean, I'm looking at defensemen still available, and I'm looking at guys like uh, Thomas Hickey. Danny DeKaiser, Chris Russell. Uh, I could see the Flames even grabbing one of those guys, knowing that, okay, when he's back, he'll probably end up as a Wrangler or on waivers. Um, you know, but some veteran presence for the Wranglers, if nothing else. And I could see them even going that road of picking one up with no intention of keeping them long term yeah. as a Flame. Yeah. Uh, if you get Russell and you lose Russell, no big deal. Yeah, exactly. It's like, okay, you can fill in for a bit. Cool. And. Yeah, but I think Michael Stone. I if if Shillington was here, I don't know that it would be as clear cut that Stone's coming back. But I think without Shillington, Stone's our best option. Yeah, clearly, like there's not even a question. And I honestly think Michael Stone will be part of the Calgary Flames organization as long as Michael Stone wants to, whether that's as a defenseman, whether that's as a scout or a GM's you know assistant or something. This is a guy who I think, sort of like Craig Conroy, is just going to be around this organization until he doesn't want to be anymore. Yeah, I agree. So as of right now, without Shillington on the um, on the LTIR, the Flames have, as of right now, according to uh, Cap Friendly, they have $425,000 in projected cap space, which if we project that out to the end of the year, to the trade deadline they will have 1.8 million Mm -hmm. it's better than the oilers the oilers have what like pocket change left i think yeah uh, i mentioned earlier like 135 dollars so yeah so something that you know mcdavid might find his pocket after a night out yeah um are you worried about the flames having so little cap space not really uh it's one of those where at the trade deadline like if the flames were to say want to go get uh, I'm just going to use an example. Patrick Kane, even though he makes like ten and a half million dollars, you know that Chicago is going to eat half, and then you'd probably broker with another team like an Arizona to eat like another quarter of that because you can do that, and then you know have him basically on quarter salary, or you know the Flames sending some salary back the other way. What about before the deadline, though? If if we can't get Shillington on um, LTIR, are you worried about even filling the defensive spot? Well, it, it, that's one of those where I think it, you would have to just ride with uh, Mackey, Stone, and Milos and see, um, you know, because like, how do you say it? the fifth, sixth spots are not as big a deal just generally. Um, like it, you're a sixth defenseman, like if he's kind of mediocre, it's more to be expected, um, that like, they're just going to be an adequate, like a fourth line forward. Like they're not going to be great. They're just going to be, as long as they're not actively screwing up every game, you're fine. And, and 
And yeah. Milos is making nine point nine nine hundred fifty thousand. So I think even then, just send him down and bring up uh, Stone, and you save some money. Yeah, it, it's one of those where we'll see. It, it, it literally, this is one of those where the sixth spot with Shillington out will sort itself out because uh it'll be literally like the competition for a top nine forward spot it's open you have to take it and if not none of them do it's such a relatively minor position on the team where if they're just adequate in that you can go find insert miscellaneous guy at the deadline uh, sort of like when we got forbort or you know gustafson or you know Fantenberg or, or any of the other miscellaneouses. I have a feeling we'll see the Flames carry less forwards this year just because it's going to be so easy to get a guy from the Wranglers if they need them. I mean, it's pretty much move your bag down the hall. Um, I could even see if they need to clear up some room, trying to float a guy like uh, Lewis through waivers. Yeah, I would, um, because of... Um, or Richie. Uh, I was going to say Richie would probably be the most likely... Out of that, uh, the fact batch. that Richardson got claimed last year, yeah, maybe you don't want to put Lewis through. And I think, yeah, Lewis is the guy Daryl wants here. Yeah. So, but um, yeah, I think even if you had to send Richie down for a week or whatever just to clear some space, I could see them also doing that and just carrying one less forward. Yeah. Um, also, Rujishka is still here. I he has to clear waivers, I think, but I don't know if he's on the opening day roster. Well, uh, yeah, he he would get claimed just as easily as Valimaki. Like I, I would honestly expect him to be gone to like Arizona or Montreal or, you know, insert miscellaneous really bad team here. Um, like the he, you know, you have a six foot four center uh, that is young and put up on pace for thirty points last year. Yeah, he would get claimed instantly. Uh, like yeah, he didn't have the best camp, but. I think he definitely needs to start even on the fourth line and work his way through the lineup. Well, let's talk about that. Let's. Uh, I think we've talked about everything we need to going into this season. I don't think there's anything else training camp wise, unless you've got something no. you want to talk about. Let's talk about what we think this lineup's going to look like. We dropped the puck on the 13th. It's the ninth as we record this, so the Flames have to be cap compliant and have a 23 man roster as of Monday. Right now, they have 24 men on the roster, so at least one guy is moving um, somewhere, and they will need to be under the cap. So, Matt, why don't I go first with my four lines here, um, and then you can chime in on these. I think line one for me is pretty cut and dry. It's going to be Huberto, Lindholm, and Toffoli. Yeah. And I'm so glad right now we brought in Toffoli last year. I know we were questioning, ah, do we want that longer-term contract? But I'm so glad we did. <laughs> yeah, he's at, at very worst – he will slot down on the second line um, if he, for whatever reason, chemistry doesn't work with Huberto and Lindholm. And then you bring Manja up there? Uh, probably Dubé, actually. Interesting. See, and, the, and Dubé, to me, is the wild card. Like, I look at line two as Manjapani and Kadri for sure. Yeah. They, they've they been playing Dubé there, but I'm not sure Dubé is a, a number one or number two right winger at this point. Well, he had such a good April last year uh, and into the playoffs. He was fairly good, and he scored at a very high clip. He ended up finishing with 19 goals on the season. So um, he seemed, after getting benched for the three games by Sutter, uh, to figure out some things in his own game, and he was markedly more physical. And in preseason, he was rather noticeable in a positive way. And it, that's where, like, if Toffoli struggles uh, in, like, by, say, game 15, game 20, and Dubé is lighting it up, I could easily see them swapping spots. Because if Dubé has taken the next step, that would be a very big thing for the Flames. Yeah, I don't know that's the first place I'd go, but I could definitely see it. Um, yeah. I just Oh, me I, either. I, it, it's one of those that... That's the most likely candidate yeah. to shift around. Based on guys that are here right now, yeah. And again, I, I yes, Dubé came alive at the end of last year, but he doesn't have the body of work in his whole career that tells me he's a second-line guy. I think he starts in the second line because he's the best option, but I'm not sure that he's the best guy for that for the majority of our 82 games. 
And, that, and that's one of those where he has to figure out where he is in the lineup. And, yeah. you know, um, that, it, and that, that is one of the good things with moving on from Gaudreau and Kachuk is that options are available for younger players like Manjapane and Dubé and any of the farm guys where, you know, if you're wanting the spot, you can take it. And, you know, uh, it, it's one of those where Dubé has a golden opportunity here to, you know, earn a lot of money. <laughs> I'm going to say that for me right now, I would leave that second line right wing open because I think that they need an acquisition there. I don't think that's going to happen by by Thursday, yeah. but I think that that's the spot that is right now unaccounted for for me. Yeah. Uh, like, unless they go pie in the sky and manage to get, like, a high-end first-line right winger and move to fully down, the more likely option is getting a good second-line right wing. With that in mind, I'm going to say, like I said, Mondrapani, Kadri, and question mark um, are, are all... Hey, maybe we can use the, the guy that we traded back and forth a few times. Mr. Considerations can play there in our lineup. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't know if we have him or if Montreal has him or where he's at now, but yeah, if he if he's here, he can play there. Um, I think the best third line we could put together is Coleman, Backlund, Dubé. Yeah, I agree wholeheartedly. And, and even though Dubé could play on the second line, I think he's going to fit the the chemistry of that line better. And they've had Lewis playing there, and to me, Lewis is above his head going into the the regular season playing on that third line. Well, and that's where it's like you know you. If Rujitsko is playing a little better, you'd kind of slot him there, like insert yeah. younger player here. But you know, or Peltier or uh, Zari, if they were more, or Phillips, possibly could have. But for whatever reason, none of them elevated themselves. So, uh, and I do agree. I would really like to see Dubé on that line for, like, I think that's a perfect trio for this I agree. year, and. You know, because Coleman and Dubé are both very fast on the wings, that that would create a lot of havoc. And then, really, that leaves us. I mean, Rooney's going to be in the lineup. He's going to be one of your top four, you know, line guys. So I think that leaves you Rooney, Lucic, and whoever. I think it'll end up being Lewis there. So if you keep Rujishka, that leaves us Richie Rujishka as our extra forwards. Yeah. Well, uh, and I think that you give uh, Rujishka more of a shot more often but you know it, i think it also depends on the caliber of your opponent like if you're meeting needing more of a defensive forward uh lewis certainly fits the bill if you're needing a more of a physical guy richie definitely but i think you know to start the season they almost have to put dubay with manjapani and kadri yeah i still wouldn't put lewis with coleman and backland though i think i would try rujishka there to start with same here but we'll see um but to me, there's still, and we've talked about this for a number of seasons, right? That right wing spot is still a glaring hole here. Yeah, and it it's one of those where, you know, like if Shillington wasn't out, you know, you could almost envision trading a guy like Shillington for that second line right winger. But, you know, with just how everything is right at the moment, like there's not it feels any... like if you're gonna fill that you're gonna have to pick someone up off waivers at this point and i mean yeah. that's not really a second line right wing guy yeah like uh the only good player on waivers right now is bemstrom from columbus and he's more of a defensive like he would fit on the back one line rather well but the only thing you might be able to do is swap like a four if somebody needs a, a defenseman maybe you swap a defenseman for a forward or something but yeah but even then, I don't know who you take out. But let's go to the back end then while we're talking about defensemen. I think for me, your first pairing going into the year has to be Henderson, Hannafin Anderson. They showed so well last year. I think you you give those guys the number one pair ball to run with. Yeah, I agree. And then I think, you know, number two is already set. That's going to be Uyghur Tanev. You don't break – those are your next best defensemen, which means Zadorov. it sounds like a, a law firm in Russia – Zadorov and company. I think it'll probably end up being Zadorov and Stone to start the year with. Um, I'm not comfortable with Nicholas Malosh there, especially at 25. I want him playing. I think Malosh will end up probably going to the farm, but I think it'll be, or he'll stay here as number seven just so we have a body for right now. But I think ultimately he's destined to be a Wrangler this season. But I think Zadorov Stone will be the last pair to start the season. Yeah. And 
basically with the defense pairs, like I'm expecting more or less like 22 minutes a night from the first and second pairing and then less for the third. And and I can even see those top four guys, those two pairs getting shuffled around on different, you know, um, like penalty kill, power play. Like, I don't think you'll keep those four together the whole game. No. And those are your, your even strength pairs. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, to me, there's one glaring hole and one minor hole, which we've talked about. The glaring hole to me is a number two RW, yeah. and the minor hole is the number six defense, which we shouldn't have that hole. That's Shillington's spot, and Shillington we know is serviceable. Um, but even yeah. with Stone there, it's, it's still serviceable. So I think really the big, the big hole, for me anyways, is that number two right. Yeah, that would be... You know, and that, I think you saw with... Uh, both Milano and Eakin getting tried out there, it was like, can Eakin take that third line left wing spot uh, so Dubé can go up, which he didn't, or can Milano take that spot and he couldn't? And yeah. it, it's one of those where valiant attempts by the Flames to you know, try to find money, so to speak, but it, it didn't work out, which you know, is more on the, the two players. Than well, anything, they brought but... in the two right guys for the job. Yeah. And Matt, there is, there is a right winger available. We could always try James Neal again. Oh, goody. Um, <laughs> do you want yeah. me to read you a list of available right wingers? Sure. This James will be Neal. a very bad, very bad list. Brian Flynn, <laughs> who I don't um, know. I've ever uh, heard of. He's a fighter. Okay. Not him. Then Alex chase on, uh, he would have been adequate like eight years ago when, you know, he was briefly here, but yeah. Cole, Cole Sherwood. I'm not sure he's a top six guy. No. Brandon Perlini, another face puncher guy who I think, I think Perlini could be good here if we needed a fourth line guy. Yeah. I think he's third line maximum. Yeah. Nicholas Henry. No idea who that is. No. 22 year old. We could, we could uh, go back to the well and bring in 36 year old Blake Como. Oh, another one where you go, oh, goody. <laughs> he was or so go spectacular. Back to the well and, and bring our old friend Tyler Pitlick back to town. I would rather that than any of the names thus far. <laughs> There's one last name. We know that we brought in Daryl Sutter's son to play in the AHL. We could bring Brandon Sutter in. Uh, is he over COVID yet? <laughs> uh, I don't know. But even if not, just quarantine him for a week. So, yeah, I, I don't know. It's uh, I mean, none of those guys are really top you know, if you're looking at the Flames to be a competitive team, which I think we all are, none of those guys are top six guys. No. And realistically... I would argue even even a stretch to call them top nine guys. Like, realistically, the only relatively easy player to acquire uh, that I've seen that's available that through trade, um, but would never trade him to us would be Yessi Puliu Yarvi from uh, the Oilers. Uh, he would fit on that second line right wing fairly well. But um, yeah, the Oilers but even then, would, what do you give up? I know, and that's one of those where you'd literally need um, another team to uh, facilitate that. Because there's no way the Oilers would be like, oh, hey, we have this disappointing forward who might break out. Let's give him to our rival. Uh, so, you know. You know, like, and that's my thing is I've looked at, you know, what trade could we do? Pooley, RV, or other guys. And it still comes to me down to what are we get, like, what are we willing to give up for that guy? And, and when I look at the Flames roster, there's really not a lot you can move at this point. No, like outside of draft picks. And I think, you know, some depth prospects. Um, but depth prospects aren't going to net you a top six forward. No. Um, but, like, how would you say? Pulley RV uh, would be kind of that, you know, you'd get him for, like, a second and a third or equivalent. So, you know, like, you'd have to facilitate this with another team uh, just because uh, the others would not want to trade him here. But that would be about the only way I could see uh, that one shaking out is, you know, like insert one of our prospects in a pick or whatever. 
but not like any of our current. Yeah, like it, it's hard, but you know, like I'm sure that I, I think this is the year we're gonna find out what Dylan Dubé is. Oh, for sure. Um, like if Dubé doesn't elevate into like a 25 goal scorer, then you know that like he is the third line winger for you know to ride shotgun with Backlund for the longer term. Which that's you need that. That's yeah. great. But um, at that point, the you- only. I guess the only other guy I might try there, sorry, I don't mean to interrupt you, but the only other guy I'd try there while we're talking is maybe if Dubé doesn't cut it, go Manjupani, Kadri, Coleman. Yeah, even that's kind of, like, that would be serviceable. It's really our only other option. I mean, you're not going to put Backlund on the wing. No, I know, and that's where it's like, that's serviceable, but... I, I think it's it's the better option because you could backfill that. Like, if you had to go Rajesh, go Backlund, Dubé, you still have a decent third line, then a decent second line. Like, I think that's the one move you can make and not really, you know, lose on yeah. your third line. True. Like, you wouldn't be cutting off your knees just because, hey. Exactly. It, it, it's just, it, it wouldn't be ideal, but you could do that. It's just, it, it wouldn't be ideal. Um, especially because, like, he and Backlund fit so well together that it it's, you know, just that makes it preferable to keep him to, with uh Backland, but you know need is uh the priority here and you know and if the flames go through part of the season um with this deficit and like there are no solutions that work out i could see another early trade like the Tafoli trade uh, where like in January, yeah, uh, the, pull the deal and you know insert miscellaneous good quality second line player here from wherever to us for yeah, you I know, can see it too. In, insert draft picks, whatever, whatever. Well, before we look ahead to the opening day, Matt, should we uh, play the game we usually play this time of year, and that's to get out our crystal balls and look ahead to the season and make some bold yearly predictions. Excellent. The, always so that, my favorite part of the uh, opening show. For some new listeners that are listening, I know we have some new people who are just joining us. Thank you. Um, every year, Matt and I make some bold predictions at the beginning of the season. We predict about 10 to 12 things. It looks like we have about a dozen this year. And then we will look back at these in January, and we'll look back at them at the end of the year and see how we did, track our progress, and uh, make fun of ourselves for being stupid at the beginning of the year. So it's, yep. a, it's a game we love to play, and uh, a lot of times our listeners will hold us to these and remind us through Twitter, through Facebook, through Instagram, um, taunt us when we uh, when we made bad decisions. And, I mean, there's been times, honestly, we have predicted things that have happened that were bold, and we said, and, and our listeners said, hey, you guys told them. It was coming, so it goes both ways. Yeah. So, Matt, let's jump into it. Uh, will the Calgary Flames name a captain for this year? And if so, who? Um, I think they might not right at the beginning of the year. Uh, I think that because of all of the alterations to the team, I think that they might want to just hold off a bit um, and let, you know, yeah, because there are a handful of new leader types uh, that weren't here, whether it's Kadri, whether it's Huberdo, whether it's Uyghur, um, or like older players like Tanev that have, or Backlund that have been here a while that, uh, you know, uh, to see which of them emerges as the captain. I don't think there is any urgency at this point. But I think that by the end of the season, they probably will have one. If I was Daryl Sutter, I would not name a captain going into the season. And around Christmas time or at the halfway mark, I would pull my players and say, who's your leader, boys? Let's name a captain. But you guys tell us who the captain is. Yeah, I think that would be the fairest option. So I'm going to say they will not have a captain to start the year. Yeah. And uh, I agree. I'm not but I, I think that they will by the end of the year. I just who do you think it'll be? I'm gonna go a little bit off the board and say Nazim Kadri. Interesting. Why Kadri? Um, he uh, similar personality as Kachuk, uh, but he grew up, and he's overcome a lot of his own 
um, hot-headedness and matured significantly as a player. And I think that um, his feistiness might be, you know, because uh, just personality-wise, um, having a more, you know, raw-raw guy, I think, might be what this team needs to kick everybody in the ass when it needs to. And I think that if they name a captain, it'll be sort of an interim captain. I've said this for years. I still think it could be Milan Lucic. Yeah, I could see that too. And for a very similar reason, because Lucic is also a very boisterous, in-your-face, let's-go, let's-go type guy. Exactly. Yeah, I don't know if Lucic has a long-term future with the Flames, but I could see him being that interim captain. Mm-hmm. Next question. Will Kadri, Huberto, and Uyghur be good enough for fans to forget about losing Kachuk and Goudreau? Uh, who are those two guys? <laughs> Actually, I was doing our uh, my fantasy draft at work, and somebody took Goudreau, and I said, ah, you picked the trader, and then they picked a chuck. I said, oh, he's also dead to me. Yeah. Uh, basically, uh, um, like I've been a huge fan of uh, Huberto because uh, the Panthers are my second favorite team, and he was my favorite player on that team. So that trade was like just excellent for me. Um, <laughs> I, I also liked Uyghur a lot, too, so it's like, yeah, that that really works. And uh, unlike a lot of Flames fans, I think Kadri's a good pickup for the Flames. Oh, uh, I think people are going to be absolutely shocked at how good uh, Kadri is at making things happen out of absolutely nothing. And you've even seen that a little bit in preseason, where like it's like, oh, we got a scoring chance there. Great. Um, where the heck did that come from? And just because Kadri is deceptively fast and very creative with the puck. And, like, in my mind, uh, like, uh, the difference between Kadri and Huberdo and Kachuk and Gaudreau, it it's, like, about a half point down. Like, it, it, you know, like, out of ten. Like, say Gaudreau and Kachuk are, like, a nine and a half. Huberdo and Kadri are nine, nine and a quarter. Which it's you know it is it's a little bit worse. I think when but we look back at this, getting Uyghur is the Uyghur huge... is going to be the the change. We got yeah. rid of two top forwards for two top forwards and a defenseman, and I think somebody like Dubé could also have the ability to step up. So I think when we look at yeah. it in a sort of you know as a, a in its totality, I guess the best way to say it, I think we're going to say yes, this is good for this organization. Well, and the thing is, is that. Um, Defense wins championships, and centers win championships. And like, if you look at uh, Lindholm, Kadri, and Backlund, like they are, they've all been nominated for the Selkie Trophy, if I recall correctly. And I like, so. and they're all excellent defensive forwards and defense first forwards, even though that they can easily light the the lamp themselves. And it's one of those where. If you're looking at like Stanley Cup contenders, Stanley Cup champions over the last ever, <laughs> usually they have three good centers and, that are good defensively and you know can contribute offensively. The Flames now have that where it, you know with Kachuk and Gaudreau as good as they are, it's just like the Flames and the Jerome McGinley era when like for a long while like their two best players were Joselius and Aginla or Tangay and Aginla, or Camilleri and Aginla. Winger, 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 winger. And, you know, like, that's fine. That was our joke That was our joke for years, right, is that we got to find the center for Jerome. Yeah, and, like, as good as Lindholm and Backlund are, uh, the sec- Monaghan, frankly, has never emerged his defensive game at all. And he was quite bad defensively throughout his career. Not horrendously bad, but it, it was certainly not a strength, and it was an area where he could have done a lot to improve. And you've gone from, you know, like even if Monahan bounces back with Montreal, like the first round pick that the Flames sent their way, because like kind of imagining that as a trade, Monahan and the first for Cadre that first round pick is worth the defensive game that Kadri brings. And especially when we're playing the Oilers, you know, Kadri is going to be following uh, McDavid all game long. 
and can keep up with him quite easily and pester him. So, to me, uh, just the positions of the two forwards versus the two forwards, I think the Flames got better just off of, you know, having a better center. And as you said, it allows Dubé to step up, and maybe if he can put 25 in, you know, which it, it wouldn't whether be Whether it's Dubé, of, whether it's Monge, you know, Monaghan, whether it's, uh, or not Monaghan, Monjapani, whether it's even Toffoli. I mean, it just yeah. it opens opportunities up here that wouldn't have been there without these guys moving. Yeah, exactly. And you have to figure that with guys with passing abilities like Lindholm, like Huberdo, like Kadri, that there are going to be a lot of goals scored by the other players because they're very excellent at passing the puck, all three of them. And, you know, Dubé is a very good shooter. Mangiapane is a very good shooter. Toffoli is a very good shooter. You know, it, those guys could surprise this year. Like, would I be shocked if one or more of them got 40 goals this year? Not entirely. Well, that was going to be my next question for you. Who do you think is going to have a breakout season for the Flames? I'm going to go with Double D, Dylan Dubé. I think he cracks 30 this year. I'm going to go with Dubé. It's who I think will be his line mate to start with. I think Andrew Mangiapane. And I think Mangiapane could be, this could be the year that we really see that he is, you know, maybe a first line wing type of player. Yeah. And I could see that too. Like I could see him being a 40 plus guy. He had a he had a great season. Um, well, another year, thing and- uh, uh, to consider with uh, uh, the acquisition of Kadri, Kadri is the best player at passing to the area in front of the net out of every player in the NHL. He was actually the most effective at it. Mangiapane is the best guy in the NHL at getting into that spot. <laughs> so the two of them might be just you know like Sedin level chemistry of my strength is your strength and you know. So it could work out that way where that would be a lot of fun. <laughs> so I'd ask you who will have a breakout season. Who needs to have a breakout season? Dylan Dubé. Um, I'm going to go the same. I think I think Mangiapane will. I think this is kind of Dubé's last crack to show he's a top six forward. Yeah. And like Dubé is good enough defensively and um, fast enough as a player where he would be... Um, like uh, JT Comfer on Colorado, a really good third liner. If that offensive game doesn't translate. And, and I think there's enough ex- young guys with Peltier, with Zari, that if he doesn't do it, he's going to get replaced. And, year. you know, and would he get kicked off the team or whatever? No, he, he would just be the third line guy where the other I guys... And there might be some trade value there, but... True, but uh, there wouldn't be any urgent rush to move him like he would still be a very serviceable third line guy for you know whenever and however long we feel that it's necessary basically um like there there's no detriment to his game like he's reasonably good defensively he's fast he's reasonably good offensively you know like those would all fit perfectly as a third line player you know but I think both you and I think there might be more there there, and you know he has to show it. Who do you think is going to struggle this year? Um, I'm going to say Noah Hannafin. Why is that? Um, I think on the power play he gets replaced by Stone and Weger, um, because Stone has that heck of a shot. And, like, on the power play, that's a big deal. Um, Hannafin was basically the number one power play guy for all of this last year. Um, and Uyghur is a very good two-way four, or defenseman as well. And he can lead the rush where Hannafin's not very good at it. Uh, so I could see Hannafin stepping back a bit into more of, like, a second-pairing defenseman role, which isn't a bad thing. You know, like, he is still a first-pairing caliber guy. It's just his production might drop because of that. And th- that'll be on him to, you know, fight with those guys to earn, you know. And yeah. he does have the talent. Like, he does have a good slap shot, and he could be a 10-plus goal defenseman 
and a 50 point guy. It's just like Dubé, he has to show it and show that he's not only able to do that, but better than Uyghur and Stone at those things, which he hasn't thus far. I'm going to go a little bit different. I'm going to say Michael Backlund struggles. I think he's a good two-way center, but every time we've seen him sort of demoted down the lineup to the third-line center, he hasn't looked as good. Michael Backlund, I think, has been better when he plays more minutes, and I think he's going to have to adjust to playing a different type of role, playing less minutes, playing with a guy like maybe Lewis. And, you know, I, I think he's going to be a good two-way guy. He's not going to get as many points, but I think he's he's going to struggle a little bit to adjust to that. Yeah, and Backlund might be one of those players, like especially like next season, that might be a cap casualty. Five and a half million as a third-line center is a tough pill to swallow. You know, and even, you know, like this year, in a hypothetical trade deadline, you might find, you know, that including him in a deal and then backfilling elsewhere that third line. It might line. be easier to backfill a third line center role if you could get, say, your top six right winger. Yeah. And because, like, Dubake plays center and has been a center his entire career up until he came to Calgary. So. Well, I know, think if Rooney performs well, Rooney could even be a third line center. Yeah, it, it, it's one of those where, like, it, you know, it, there are options uh, instead of, you know, and that's not to say that we want to get rid of Michael Backlund at all. Like, you know, it's just... Going back to the question here... Cap we is a thing, and, you know... it. I, yeah, and I've said for a couple of years, you've heard me say for a couple of years, I think Backlund will end up being a cap casualty. I thought it would be earlier than it is. Yeah. But I, I think he'll end up as a cap casualty. Yeah. We haven't talked anything about defense, uh, goaltenders, and I think we both know who our, our goalies are here. But um, uh, the other name I was thinking of in terms of who could have a breakout season is Dan Vladar. And, I mean, he's never going to take the starter job, but if you look at how good he looked in the – in the uh, preseason, I think he could definitely have a breakout season there. Yeah, it's one of those things that with young goalies, you just never know exactly what their ceiling is until they show you. And could Vladar be a starting goalie in the NHL? Yes. But we don't know. And and he's not going to overtake Markstrom. No, it, it, but it might be one of those where... Yeah, you know, like if he and Markstrom are basically putting up equivalent numbers, then that might, you know, like at the end of the season, it might be one of those, well, hey, maybe because Wolf is kicking butt because he, he's awesome too, that you might be able to save the $6 million and move Markstrom and keep Vladar, and, yep. you know, and go with Wolf or sign a veteran for a year and let Wolf have another year and saw or the Wranglers and then uh you know go that route afterwards um it it literally just depends on how each of them performs but I would expect uh, Vladar to get more starts this year than he did last year I agree who do you think is going to pleasantly surprise us this year I think uh I'm honestly going to say Jonathan Huberto after losing uh Gaudreau and Kachuk uh, I know a lot of Flames fans are basically like their thoughts have been is like, well, where are the goals going to come from? And, you know, both of those guys were flashy skill guys. And, you know, uh, that goal uh, against Winnipeg is just a drop in the bucket. Um, that spinorama passing to Lindholm who pass it to Toffoli for the goal. Um, like, the, that's just a drop in the bucket. And I think that he, he is going to calm a lot of the concerns that Flames fans might have about, you know, like losing your top two guys and um, like it, just from a pure entertainment value, like Huberto is absolutely amazing. So I think that that'll be a pleasant surprise. I, I'm already expecting a lot from Huberto, so I'm not going to say that I think he'll pleasantly surprise us, but I'm going to go with Kevin Rooney. He's brought in as the fourth-line center. I think there's a guy, and we even saw him play some wing in the offseason. I think there's a guy that, for what he's making, could end up playing higher up the lineup and, again, could allow the Flames to maybe move on from a guy like Michael Backlund if he can take that third-line center role. Yeah, the only concern I have with Rooney is his lack of offensive game. 
And like if he can figure out how to chip in, like his career high in goals is six. And you know, like yes, he was playing on the fourth line with New York and New Jersey, but you know, like yeah, it it's one of those where you know he needs to show more there in terms of offensive production because like if you just staple him in as the third line center now like that's going to be abysmal production for a third line center and i don't know that he needs to get a lot more points like i think if you look at the guys you could play him with he could be the well maybe he he doesn't get more goals but i think he could be that puck mover guy and i agree not now but i think by the end of the season, yeah. we might look back and go, wow, Rooney did a really good job. I think yeah, he could be like, an upgraded, uh, cheaper Derek Ryan. Yeah, like basically, in my mind, like any third line guy needs to have 30 ish points, regardless of which position. And, you know, like basically in my head, 30 for the third, 50 for the second, and like 70 plus for the first. And, like, Rooney hasn't shown the ability to get 25, so that's the only area where I have any concern with him. Because, like, defensively he's great, speed-wise he's great. It's just, uh, you know, can he actually translate some offensive game to him? Because if he turned into a Derek Ryan clone, like, that would be absolutely perfect. It's just, you know, uh, like Dubé, uh, he has to show it. Who's going to be the number one point getter for the Flames this year? Uberdo. I agree. Who's going to be, and we'll do this for both. I, I'm going to actually uh, ask you a follow-up question because that one's kind of an automatic. Who's the second highest scorer? Because that's more of point a getter? point getter. Uh, Elias Lindholm. I'll go with Kadri on that one. I think Lindholm's going to be setting up a lot of those goals on the first line. Yeah. Who do you think for forward and defense are your first call ups this year? Uh, forward. Yeah, I I'm gonna be boring and say Zahorna, just because his it's the size. logical choice. Yeah, and like defense would probably be Gilbert or Milos if he gets sent down. Uh, you know, just to be like perfectly boring. Or Connor Mackey if he goes through waivers. Like, any of those three. Like, whoever... It would be, like, Mackey, then Maloche, then Gilbert, if all three of them are down there. But who knows who's going to be the number seven. I'm going to say Mackey, probably for the first call-up on defense. Um, Because I don't think he'll be here to start with. If he is, then I would probably say... I'll go a little bit off the board. I'll say Pullman. Okay. I think they might want to see what they've got there in Pullman. And for forwards, I don't think, like everyone said, I don't think it's going to be Peltier, Zari, those kind of guys. But knowing who they've got and what they might want to see, I think that the most logical forward and the guy that I think is the most versatile is going to be Clark Bishop. Yeah. Uh, if the Flames lose a guy out of their top nine, uh, top six more so, um, the player that... I would like to see them give an actual shot to is Matthew Phillips because I think he showed enough where he could play in the NHL. It's just the reticence of do you shoehorn the guy that's even smaller than Gaudreau in the top six? And I think, you know, honestly, Matthew Phillips being a Calgary boy is going to be there's some marketing angle there to keeping him in the Wranglers. Yeah. Oh, and I agree. I just think that, like, if they're, like, say, you know, Toffoli misses a month. I think you have to bring Phillips up just to, you know, because he is a good right And he's winger. one of the older guys, too, yeah. Yeah, and you have to know if you're going to keep him or, like, if can he cut it in the NHL? Because, you know, he was basically, like, the leading scorer in the AHL if you go point by point, or point per game. Um, so, you know, like, he does have a pedigree of being an offensive dynamo at least in the minors. And, you know, sometimes those guys do actually translate into high quality top six forwards. So, you know, you already you got them. Why not try if need be? Do you think any um, call up, and, and we, we won't look at this as maybe the guy who replaces uh, Shillington right away, but anyone after that will end up making a full time roster spot for himself this year? Um, 
The only guy I could really see that is Peltier, but he I don't would think he have to call up. Yeah, it, it, he would have to have like a good season, and it'd be like the second half of the year type of situation. Honestly, like Connor Zari's, he played really great in the preseason, and like I was very impressed by him. Think that he will be in the NHL next year. But uh, I think because of all of his injuries and assorted BS with COVID stuff, that he just needs time in Stockton to go tear the, the league a new one and, you know, carry on from there. And yeah, I think both him and Pelty have a shot next year, but I don't think either of those guys are going to come up this year and end up being, um, you know, a full timer by the end of the year. Again, that would only be, I think that either one of them would get a shot if injuries, you know, like say Backlund misses the last half of the season with like a knee injury or something, then I could see like Zari getting a shot just because, like if he's having a really good year in, in with the Wranglers to, you know, okay, well, we have a third line spot. Let's see what you got, kid, if you're tearing it up and... Maybe yeah. that would basically be like the only situation I could see that happening though. On either I think Rajisha is going to start here. Otherwise, I think he could be that guy. And yeah. by full time spot, I don't mean necessarily playing every night, but being on the Calgary Flames roster for the majority of the season. Yeah. Well, I, I'm assuming that Rajitska will be here all year. Uh, like even if he doesn't play every game, just because of the fact that he He's, will he be claimed. Yeah, yeah, he won't make it through waivers. It doesn't matter at what point in the season he, because he is six foot four and a center, he will get claimed because every team likes centers that are big. And you know, <laughs> he's on our team. Hopefully, he figures out whatever he's not particularly great in and can move on. <laughs> Who do you think will be the first flame traded? Um. Unless it's uh, like inclusion for cap reasons, like say Lucic at the deadline, I, I don't see the Flames trading off any players. Um, like and like if I think that like like last season, it would be just purely adding uh, via draft picks and prospects. I'm gonna go a little bit different on this one, and I'll probably end up regretting it eventually, but. I could end up seeing the team trading Oliver Shillington. I can see this being a thing where he doesn't come back and they're sort of trading that salary. And it's it's a reasonable salary to somebody else. Yeah, I could see that. Again, the, that would be like salary purposes like with Lucic though. So, Do the Flames win the Battle of Alberta this year? Yeah. I agree. Where do you think the Flames finish the regular season in the Pacific Division? First. It's a weak division. They, they're they going to be either one or two with Edmonton, I think. Yeah, and Edmonton is not nearly as good overall as the Flames. Like, it just their defense, their goaltending. Like, they're a, a lot better than they have been, and, like, they're legitimately a good playoff team. It's just that I do not expect them to be that good. And, like, if they were, say, in the, the Central Division... Or um, the Murderers Row division uh, with Carolina and all them, like I don't think that they make the playoffs <laughs> necessarily. Uh, but um, because the Pacific is basically hot garbage, except for us and them, yeah. Uh, like even Vegas, I'm not expecting to make the playoffs again. I think they're on the downward trajectory i think la is going to get in just by default because somebody has to um but yeah the it's yeah it's two teams in this division how many regular season season points do the flames end with i'm gonna go 124 it's very specific yeah i'm gonna go a little bit less i was coming into this thing in 120 yeah I think that the Flames win the President's Trophy. How far will the Flames go in the playoffs? Not how far do we want them to? How far do we think they will? Well, is this going to be the one year you don't think they're Stanley Cup champions and they finally are? Um, well, I look at Colorado as basically being the only team that's there in, in, as an equivalently talented 
team. Um, and the Flames actually, in a lot of respects, are deeper than the Avalanche now. Because uh, losing Kadri really hurts them <laughs> and directly benefits us. And frankly, this team is built to win the Stanley Cup. So, like, frankly, expectations for the organization should be Stanley Cup or bust for the next four years. Um, so I'm going to go with that just because all of the pieces are now in place. And, like, if we need anything at the trade deadline, like we saw last year, the Flames went out and got uh, Yarn Croc and uh, Toffoli. It, the Flames are going to sacrifice draft picks. They are going to sacrifice prospects if they need to. To, you know, like, would I be shocked if Patrick Kane is wearing a Flames jersey later in the season? No. Would I be shocked if any of the high end free agents are wearing a Flames jersey? No. So I think the Flames are going to go for it and, like, all in go for it. Uh, and, yeah, it'll be a fun year. <laughs> so you're saying the Stanley Cup Finals? Yeah, I'll say, yeah. I'm not convinced this team goes from first-round exits to Stanley Cup Finals. I think they're going to make it the Western Conference Finals. I think Colorado probably beats them. And then they run and make a better run next year. That's that's um, gonna be my guess. The only thing um, that I would counter that, like they did make it to the second round last year, and yeah, they they did fall on their face a bit with the Oilers, but but even uh, then, I mean, they're yeah, a perennial first and out team. Yeah, and last the, year they were still really good, and they still only made it to the second. Yeah, but uh, in my mind, uh, the two problems were removed, and you know. They replace them with non problems, so we'll you see. know, yeah, you because know, uh, it's one of those like the Flames kind of cycled out all the deck chairs on this organization. Like literally, Rasmus Anderson is the second longest tenured Flame. Um, so like they changed everything else other than Gaudreau, Kachuk, and Monahan. Now all three of them are gone, and we replace them with better play, well, equivalent players. I don't so, disagree. I just don't know that it's yeah. one year that you know that they come together and do all that. Well, I think that um, a difference between it, like this team reminds me a lot of St. Louis when they won the cup, where like they had a lot of the good foundation already in place, like this team had, and like then they got Ryan O'Reilly, and like that just seemed to be the straw that mixed the drink. And I think getting Cadre in a lot of the same ways will help this team take that next level. Cause I, think oh, I don't, I don't disagree. It's going to help them take the next level. And I mean, we'll agree to disagree on this one, Matt, but I yeah. just don't know that the next level is from being blown out around two to sipping from Lord Stanley's mug. Yeah. And I think a lot of that, like from, when I'm looking at this team, I think that they need one more scorer, um, like legit scorer. Mm -hmm. Um, and, like I would be move it, willing to move the bank basically for anybody who's like a good thirty plus goal scorer. It, as long as you can fit them in under the cap, great, go for it, and you know let her rip. And it's sort of like how the Oilers got Evander Kane, and like that really, you know, put them from being a, a possible playoff team to getting to the conference finals i think that like this team right now can make the conference finals as is but i think that to elevate themselves to you know not just getting there but possibly actually winning the stanley cup they need one more score which i think the flames will go get at some point this year who do you think will be the unexpected playoff hero? I think last year we could say it was michael stone the guy that we didn't expect to come out and look as good as he did who do you think it'll be this year I'm going to go a bit odd and say Mackenzie Weger. Why? I, I think he's going to take another step this year. And he is a very good two-way defenseman. But I, when I watched him last year with Florida, like even though he was elevating his game after Ekblad left, it felt like, there was still another notch on the ladder for him. And I think that he's going to take that this year. And I, I think that he will emerge as like a Norris finalist this year. 
um, and be like one of the very elite players in the NHL and, you know, into the playoffs, be like the regeer of who can actually score. <laughs> I'm going to say Tyler Toffoli. I think by the time we get there, Toffoli, if he's oh, a I first agree. line right winger, I, I don't think he's going to be that player all season. But I think in the playoffs, we could see a real burst of offense from this guy. Yeah. And you could see like last year, he was so sneak bit and got so many good chances exactly. that like if he started burying them, you know, uh, then yeah, he would have been the story. It, it's just. You know, for whatever reason, they just, you know, like he was robbed like five times by Ottinger <laughs> and like h highway robbery by him. And, you know, like I can understand why he was a little frustrated <laughs> during those games because it's like, what more do I have to do? Damn it. <laughs> well, let's get through the last couple here. Yeah. Um, will Daryl Sutter win Jack Adams again? Yes. I agree. Will. Brad Treliving be the GM of the year. I, I think that, you know, by like uh, July 15th, whenever the Kachuk trade was, you could write that in then. I think and at this point you could almost more... rename the trophy the Tree Living GM of the Year Award. Yeah, pretty much. Like, this was not only like the best offseason for the Flames in Flames history in terms of like what happened and the response. I think that was the best offseason by any general manager in NHL history just because of the calamity that was dumped on their lap by surprise. Like, yay, your two good players are gone. <laughs> and how he dealt with that. Like, that was nothing short of remarkable. That's and the kind of thing you're going to see in, you know, if there was like, if you could get a degree in GM school, that's the kind of summer that they would talk about in the textbooks. Like, I also, like, follow basketball to a small extent and baseball quite heavily i have never seen a gm of any of the teams in any of those sports have as good of an offseason that true living had like it, it, this was a remarkable masterpiece by him true living it, really deserves to sip from lord stanley's mug whether this year or in the next couple for everything he's done i mean this is gonna yeah. be his eighth year here but he's been fantastic since he's been here yeah like uh, it's nothing short of remarkable and like if we were talking about other teams around the league and he was a GM of say, you know, Minnesota and they had this kind of an off season. We'd all be talking about what a spectacular job that guy did. It just happens to be our team. And, you know, thanks tree. <laughs> like you really saved us from going through a rebuild <laughs> and made the team better, which sure. <laughs> why not? Do you think that Jacob Markstrom will win the Vesna trophy? Um, no, I don't think he's going to play enough to get it. Actually. I think that it's gonna, He's going to get about 55 games. Um, and it's what 60 or 65 is the minimum. Uh, and not necessarily. It's just, uh, I think that, um, like there's not going to be a, as much of a difference between him and Vladar's stats to say, oh, he's clearly awesome type of thing. It, and uh, to be frank, I it's more that I think Igor Shesterkin is awesome, so I think he's going to win it again because he's awesome. No so goalie than... in the last six years. I'm just looking it up here. Has played less than you have to play a minimum of 25 games, um, but no one's played less than that. Looks like 60. Yeah, I, I think I think that Vladar is good, but I think Vladar is going to be a good piece on a good team. He's not going to be standing on his head to take a bad team to the finals or the playoffs. And that's the guy that whoever that is, that I think will win the Vesna. Yeah, uh, like for me, like Shesterkin, though, is, is like on a different level. And like for me, like until he shows that he's human, <laughs> I think that the Vesna is basically his. Last question for you. What do the Flames need to do to be successful this season? Well, frankly, anything less than the conference finals, based on all of the things that they've done, and like I'm sure they will do throughout this season, and like the coaching staff, and 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 like anything less than the conference finals is a disappointment. Um, first round would be a disaster of uh, you know monumental proportions. 
uh, to quote McTavish there. Um, but uh, it's one of those where, you know, like ideally cup or bust, but really they have to get through the Pacific Division and like, okay, we're one of the big boys now. Let's go and, you know, go for it. Yeah, I would, I would even say, Matt, and, you know, again, maybe I'm on a bit of a, a different wavelength, but not just get to the finals, but after what we saw from last year with Edmonton, they need to get to the finals and they need to be competitive. Yeah. Like, I don't think if we get to the finals and we get blown out, sort of like we did in that Edmonton series by Colorado or whoever's there, I don't think we can really say, okay, so we just prolong the inevitable blowout in a way. I think we've got to get there and we've got to really be able to say, okay, we're we're there and we're legit. Know, we're legit. We can compete at that level. Yeah. And like that's why like I think that the Flames will at some point this season, whether it's sooner or later, go out and get another scorer to like stack the deck where you have two awesome scoring lines, an awesome third line, an awesome fourth line, an awesome defensive group, and Markstrom. Like, you know, have fun, everybody. You're going to get <laughs> a lot coming at you and not have a good time. <laughs> no, I think I think you're totally right there. And I think that's really. Yeah, I think there, you have to make the conference fun. You have to do better than you did last year. Yeah. I mean, that's that's kind of inevitable. Um, no, and plus, like, with the raised expectations and, like, the fact that they went with slightly older players, like, your well, timeline you, is basically four years. And yeah, you've you've got three years, I think, out of this team, but every year you you your guys get older. I think they've got to show they're making forward progress this year. Yeah, that's why it's kind of, like, to me, cup or bust, you know, but... Like I can understand, like if they run into Colorado and it goes seven and or, or six or seven and it goes Colorado's way, well, yeah. But the Avalanche are also the defending Cup champions. But if they get swept like the Oilers did, then you know, like that will be embarrassing. Um, and be like, are any of these guys actually good? <laughs> like you know, and having a more in-depth conversation on like you know. Are guys like Anderson and Hannafin and Tanev and 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 or Markstrom like are they actually viable players or do we need to like say trade Markstrom for insert starter here or whatever whatever and you know like that's a whole different conversation. Let's have that discussion at the end of the year. Yeah. We're running long today. There's one more game that we want to play every week for, again, our new listeners. This is our weekly prediction game. And every week we predict the scores of what we think the uh, games coming up for the Flames are going to be. Traditionally, I beat Matt pretty handedly. Matt, you beat me 6-1 to one last year for the first time. I know. I actually, you know, took the game seriously. I, I mean, I always do, but, you know, it, it's, yeah. They actually listened to me this time, so... <laughs> There, they, they haven't been listening to you before. That's the problem. Yeah. When you say when, they say what? Huh? There's another letter? <laughs> they, they're not used to hearing Peter what, Marr? What? Huh? <laughs> where's, where's that Peter guy? What column are we supposed to put this game in? Jeez, I'm confused. Darn. <laughs> um, this week, we got two games. The Flames will start the season at home on Thursday the 13th. 7.30 start time in the Saladome against the Stanley Cup champion Colorado Avalanche. And then they will go for a quick road trip on Saturday, just up the QE2 to Edmonton for an 8 p.m. start time. How do you think we're going to do this week, Matt? The Cleveland Browns won to start this year. And that the Flames and the Browns were tied for longest ineptness in season openers in sports history. <laughs> The the brown streak ended, so the flames technically are the longest going, and they have to win that game against Colorado. Which, if they were playing anybody else, uh, I might be tempted to say that they oh it it's time for them to win, but it's also Colorado. Um, yeah, they're gonna lose that game. <laughs> um. Just because you know, I think the last time the Flames won the home opener was 2009. Like, it's been a long freaking time. So, yeah. And playing the defending Stanley Cup champions, yeah, no. 
Um, and they'll probably beat Edmonton because payback for the playoffs. So I'm going to go two wins this week. That's what I'd like to see, especially because I'm going to be there. I, you know, I do not want to see the Flames get skunked. Matt, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to give you an early advantage in the game because I know you're going to need it. So I'm going to go two wins this week. Okay. You're, you're welcome. You're, you're just going to have to alternate between like win them all, lose them all like I did. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I haven't formulated my strategy yet. Okay. <laughs> well, um, before we get out of here this week, we'd like to remind everyone that uh, you can find us, you can interact with us, you can chat with us online on Twitter. We're twitter.com slash fireside podcast. On Facebook, we're facebook.com slash fireside chat. We have an Instagram as well where we are fireside chat underscore podcast. Um, and next week, I will announce our TikTok. I'm going to be experimenting with some TikTok stuff this week. Uh, not fully up yet, but I'll announce that next week. So if you aren't following us or aren't uh, chatting with us on social, let us know what you think. Let us know your predictions for some of those predictions. We'd love to hear from everybody. And we will we will hear from each other next week. And as always, go Flames, go. Fireside Chat is hosted by Dan Stevenson, co-hosted by Matt DeBorg. This episode produced and edited by Peter Marino. Fireside Chat is licensed under Creative Commons license. For full license details, visit firesidechat.ca.